Okay, we are going to get going. I am sure more people will join us as the as the event progresses. But welcome to everyone. Uh, thank you so much for joining us for what I know is going to be a fantastic discussion about impact. My name is Bena Chipola, and I am the former editor in chief and publisher of Beat. Beat is a nonprofit news organization covering public education in eight states across the country. It's also now covering voting with its sister publication, VoteBeat. And as part of a Google News Initiative program, Chalkbeat developed a local news field guide. You can find that at fieldguide.chalkbeat.org. And this online workshops, this is the first of, of several, all reflect pieces of that field guide. I am joined by two incredible local news leaders. I will let them introduce themselves, Jean Friedman Rudowski and Sonam Vashi. Uh, Jean and Son, if you want to intro yourselves. Sure. Hi, I'm Jean Friedman Rudowski. I am the co executive director and co founder of Resolve Philly. Hey, y'all. I'm Son Mbashi. I'm also a co founder and co director of Canopy Atlanta in Atlanta, Georgia. Amazing. Thank you. Uh, we will do some questions at the end, uh, about 2 30 Eastern time. You can drop your questions into the Q&A or the comments section, and we'll be monitoring throughout and, and get to those at the end. We'll also be launching a couple of polls during our time together. No obligation to respond, but it will give us a better sense, and your colleagues here in the, in the chat, um, uh, of how, a better sense of how your organizations operate with respect to impact. So impact, it's not a new idea in journalism, but it has gained more adoption in the past 10 years or so. And in part, that's been a response to the emphasis on page views and other digital audience measurements. So what do we mean by impact? In a nutshell, it's journalism having an effect on individuals, organizations, and society. Again, super broad and basic definition of impact Journalism having an effect on individuals, organizations, and society. What does that look like? Here are three really quick examples from Chalkbeat. In Chicago, the school district replaced faulty computers that were given to a Southside school after our inquiry. Also after our inquiry, the Inspectors General's office launched an investigation into that sale. In Newark, we looked into how a school bus shortage affected students with disabilities in particular, and that story resulted in bus assignments for those students, including the one profiled in this story. And in New York, our reporting led to a change in policy from a major internet provider, which meant that more families got free Wi-Fi during school closures early on in the pandemic. So readership, that's nice, it's one thing, but really how is your journalism affecting your community or your communities? And how can your own organization center impact as a goal and a value that we'll be talking about today with Jean and Sona. So at Chalkbeat, readership isn't our top goal. If people are reading our stories, that's really nice, we love it, but if nothing happens as a result, then we're not really doing our jobs. We wanna provide information that helps people make decisions. And those decisions might happen at the individual or the family level, at the school level, or at the district or at the state level in the case of, of Chalk Bee covering education. We're trying to drive conversation and debate and also help people make decisions, take action. So those are the two kinds of impact we track, debate and action. Curious to hear from both Jean and Sonam um, how they view impact at Resolve and at Canopy and why it's important to their organization. Um, Sonam, let's start with you. Sure, yeah. So um, I think really similarly, Benna, to Chalkbeat um, and, and to Resolve Philly, I'm sure, you know, we, we really decided early on that reach was not going to be what you know, the number one value that we were going to bring to our local news ecosystem, which is already pretty diverse and rich. There's a lot of different types of organizations. And I think, you know, a lot of us that found of Canopy Atlanta, and there were a lot of us, um, you know, I think we all came from experiences in newsrooms that made us pretty careful and wary about the types of incentives that focusing on reach and those types of metrics can set up for an organization, whether it's, you know, kind of content metal type of work or 
that kind of thing. And so when we started, and even more so now, um, we were really thoughtful about building that theory of change of, of how do we intend for our work to make impact and how can we build everything we do really around that? And so what ended up being centered in all of that, and I think what we bring in terms of our specific value is about those relationships and the community and power and leadership that we want to see in Metro Atlanta. And so that's why our model, which is training based, so we're actually working with residents to produce the journalism that we that we put out um, and, and that we're working with residents to choose the journalism that we put out. That's why our model looks the way it does. And so impact for us really looks at, you know, the, that equipping and resourcing residents with tools to make daily decisions and shape their neighborhoods. I love that term, zone of resourcing residents. I think that's so important in the kinds of impact journalism that, that the three of our organizations try to do. Jean, I know impact is so central at, at Resolve. Tell me how it, it played a part in your own origin story. Yeah, so it's, I mean, it's interesting hearing the two of you articulate because I think there's strands of both of what both of you said that is really get incorporated in the work that Resolve Philly does. Um, you know, Benna, going off of what um, you mentioned, I mean, thinking, you know, primarily about how can reporting that we are, you know, primarily sort of facilitating or fostering, because we don't do a whole lot of original reporting and content generation with Resolve Philly. We are about, you know, collaborative reporting projects, sending information out through SMS, you know, various types of programs um, that really, that are built on equity and collaboration and the elevation of community voices and solutions. So, you know, thinking about that solutions framework, how are we um, giving people the the, the tools and the information to make more informed decisions in their lives. Um, and some of that comes from doing solutions journalism of not just kind of shining a light on what has gone wrong, but also really interrogating best practices and showing people um, the possible solutions that are out there to really complicated um, social problems. And then there is also the the equipping work um, that, you know, Canopy Atlanta is doing in, um, <clears throat> sorry, that Canopy Atlanta is doing in Atlanta, um, thinking about, you know, how are we working with community members to be able to um, produce journalism and to be able to really have a role in the editorial cycle, whether it's through kind of feedback loops that we um, generate with our community engagement team, or actually through the production of our free community newsletter, which we do through a group of what we call um, info hub captains, which are community members who already kind of have a informal um, information sharing um, capacity in their neighborhoods and we're equipping them with um, with journalism skills. So all of that is to say, you know, we think we think every day about impact. It's like core of what we do on both kind of the, you know, meso, bigger picture, larger policy stuff that you said, Edena, and also on the more kind of micro, how are we, you know, empowering folks to get more involved in journalism processes. That's such a good point, Jean, and, and Sonam, I, I think you agree there. The, the level at which uh, we all are tracking impact, we're looking at it at different levels, right? So whether you're talking about an individual, a family, a neighborhood, a city, a state, national policy, it's often the really big ones that tend to get a lot of attention, right? These kind of juicy, years-long investigative series. But... I'd say, you know, at Chalkbeat, we, we really believe that those individual decisions that we could help people make uh, were really just as important as the bigger ones. Um, men in the community who help someone, say, advocate with their child's teacher as it did to have a whole school or a district policy. I mean, yes, more people are affected, but you don't want to lose sight of those smaller, more connective relationships that you're trying to build in, in your community. So just curious from, from either of you, um, kind of the levels of tracking that, that you do uh, with your impacts. There's a lot of levels, <laughs> sort of what we um, what we track, and I know um, 
Anne-Marie, who's sort of backstage running this show, has like a screen grab of our impact tracker, which is, um, I think there's, I don't know, 1,800 um, entries in there. We use Airtable. We love Airtable. Um, but, you know, it. we are tracking, yes, everything. There you go. Um, we are tracking everything from that, you know, big picture meso stuff um, to, um, you know, qualitative data that we get um, of the, you know, of just, you know, people responding to our text line saying, thanks, this was really helpful. This helped me do X, Y, or Z. We send out surveys on the text line to try to elicit that kind of qualitative feedback. And then everything kind of in between. I mean, some of the examples you see there is, you know, we think a lot about kind of yeah, financial return on investment um, because of kind of how our organization grew. You know, it started with the Reentry Project and then Broken Philly, this sort of model for collaborative reporting that's been replicated in lots of places. We also, you know, think about our impact on the journalism industry side. So thinking about, you know, replication, adaptation of things that we're doing. Um, so there's a lot of layers there. And we have from the beginning kind of always deferred to tracking more rather than tracking less like we kind of have this joke within resolve like if you don't think it even if if you're questioning whether it's impact it is put it in the impact tracker and so that is why we have built such a, a large database thank you uh, i think there's also a screen grab of mori which is chalkbeat's impact tracker mori stands for measures of our reporting's influence as you can see on the screen it started as a wordpress plugin um, similar to resolve it feeds into a spreadsheet it's just google it's not even Airtable. Mm -hmm. um, and then when we moved off wordpress as our content management system we moved Mori into this type form that, that you see on screen here. It still powers a spreadsheet. So someone on staff is responsible for maintaining, updating the spreadsheet, making sure the formulas are, are working. Everyone at Shopbeat though has access to view it because we think it's really important that everyone feel like they, they're invested in impact. And what that's whether they work in the newsroom or work on the finance team or the people team or any other team at Chalkbeat. We're all we're all trying to, to, to achieve impact no matter what team you're on. Um, and reporters and editors input impacts from a drop down list of categories. And again, like we were just talking about, we, we did want to make sure that we included small, small scale impacts, so individual or family level, as well as those those broader ones. Um, and that's what we pull from that spreadsheet when we're in a public forum like this, or we're having an all hands meeting or even reporting out to funders, um, both the numbers, because it's nice to see those numbers tick up year over year, um, but also the stories and the anecdotes, right? Because numbers can't possibly tell the whole story of, of the kinds of work you're doing in, in communities. Um, so I'm curious how, how Canopy tracks impact and, and how also for, for both of you, kind of the responsibility, the accountability issue um, in your organizations and, and who is inputting, who's maintaining and, and who's collating everything. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, I joked with Jean, I think when we were talking uh, last week that she needs to put in her impact tracker, the fact that we use Resolve Philly's like <laughs> framework for their impact tracker, which uh, is publicly available, which is amazing. Um, it, it's also, you know, as an Airtable fan, I think that is like a really useful tool for us. But of course, we've modified it to the categories and methods that like we use. So, you know, our whole model is really built around these community relationships. And so that takes a lot of capacity. Um, that's still something we're figuring out. It's a challenge for us right now. Um, community surveying and follow up about like what people thought of our stories. It's really essential to our work. Um, that relies being out in the community and listening to folks both on the front end and the back end of our stories to close that gap. Um, but one thing I think it's kind of interesting is, is like thinking about, you know, if, if our model is built around those community relationships, you know, there are ways that like the programming we're actually doing can be in and of itself a type of tracking. So, you know, for example, we have all these amazing residents who participate in our fellowship and now we have, you know, all these fellow alumni. So, we're building events and infrastructure for them to keep in touch, to communicate, to share resources and opportunities. And that's, you know, furthering our mission of equipping, you know, residents to, to shape their neighborhoods. 
but it also helps us track our impact because that means that they're coming, you know, and, and sharing what's going on with them and telling us and asking us for recommendations and things like that. And so, you know, it's, it, I really like the ways that that kind of organically happens because of that alignment. It's interesting, Sonam, I think, to, to dig in there a little bit, just because you're, you're talking about impact on the folks you're engaging with to do the work and not just the work itself. And I know that's shown up, Gene, too, in, in Resolve's work. And I'm just curious to hear a little bit more from both of you on, on that. Well, I think also just going back to the kind of previous question that you had on like, you know, capacity and who is responsible for this kind of within, um, within your organization, because, um, you know, when we put a link to our customizable impact tracker and tools are great, we love tools. And also, as we know, tools are only as valuable as like the humans that power them. And so, you know, our, so um, Cassie and I co-founded Resolve in 2018. Our first hire um, was Julie Christie, our editor of Data and Impact. Like that's how it, Central Impact was to our organization, and it was Julie's job. I mean, she she built this impact tracker for us, um, and she is the one who who kind of held that within the organization and helped us set up practices internally um, to ensure that we were keeping up with this. And it was everything from, you know, in the beginning, um, in every staff meeting, we would, when we were a smaller team, take a few minutes to just like kind of go around and verbalize cool impact and like literally put it in the tracker when we were there. At different points, we've had interns within Resolve set up 30 minute meetings with people on our team to just like also help them track impact because we know that it is, you know, and I am just as guilty as this as other folks of like, it is sometimes the last thing I will leave for a week for a month and and I don't get as much in there as I should. And so it is really, it is really helpful if there is someone in your organization, even if they don't have the impact editor or whatever in their title, who can kind of hold the thread and be responsible for it. Because Julie has since moved on to other important work within the organization. And we we feel it. We feel the impact, even, even though it's like so, you know, corner, it, it's such a cornerstone of what we do. And we do have these practices embedded. Even with that, we still feel the absence of having someone who like, that is really a core part of their responsibilities. That totally makes sense. I know I have, uh, I have been the person right in our in our slack <laughs> time to like your impacts time to like your impacts um so i i, I feel that uh burden too Jean. yeah um okay so we've talked a little bit about why impacts important how we track it we also celebrate it um so you know wanted to talk a little bit about how we all share wins um and how that helps reinforce that impact is really a, a cornerstone, as, as Jean said, of, of your organizational culture. Um, so, you know, we, we did that um, at Chalkbeat via all hands meetings. We always have what we called an impact spotlight where, you know, a reporter and or an editor and or an audience person, whoever was involved, um, could really tell the story of, of the project that they worked on, whether it was a, an article, a package, an event, um, whatever it was. And we also had a Slack channel so the spreadsheet would automate would automatically update in the Slack channel uh, called impact every time someone logged in impact. And that was fun because then you could respond to the person who logged it and say, hey, wow, this is amazing. It was also a great way for other teams to be seeing this in real time, not just waiting for an all hands meeting. And honestly, great for nonprofit for our development team to get access to those immediately for um, communication with funders. So curious, you know, Sonam at, at Canopy, how, how you all celebrate wins and, and each other. Yeah, I mean, that, that's so crucial. I mean, we're also like doing it into our weekly or monthly meetings and, and using a Slack channel, you know, although I think everyone has their preferred way of communicating all that. I, I think one of, and you know, this is so crucial too, because I think, doing this work is really hard um, in a lot of ways. Like uh, we, none of us probably have like the capacity that we would like or, or you know, all of the things that we need. Um, and it's just such an important reminder that of why we do this work and how we know it's working. And so, you know, one thing we've, we've been, um, it's not mandatory in any way, but like been really encouraging all of our staff members to do is also just be community facing in different ways, whether that's, you know, helping with some of the community listening work or, 
um, you know, just, just coming to events that we hold. Um, and so that's also a chance to see impact in real time. Um, you know, we held, held an event uh, last month that was based on a story we did around um, a police officer who, you know, we heard from, from this particular community that there used to be a police officer that a lot of folks had a relationship with and knew for, for years that just kind of disappeared one day. And they were like, what happened to him? And so we actually did a story through uh, that we, you know, trained and, and paid a resident to help us report, and, and it was her reporting, to, to find this officer and figure out what happened to him. Um, and, and she did, and it was so emotional. Um, you know, he had left because of pay cuts to the police force. And so we held an event to bring that officer back to the community and have this like kind of, you know, just discussion and, and uh, around the, uh, the story as well. But, um, you know, seeing that happen and, and for staff members, they were able to see that happen, I think is also a way of like celebrating that win in, in many ways, even if that's like also part of the impact itself. Got it. That's great. Um, what a I like feel the emotion when you're when you're talking about that story. That's amazing. Um, okay, so we celebrate, we track their corner cornerstones of all of our organizations. What about kind of North Star metrics? And and you know, we we track them, you measure them. Um, what are those metrics? So you know, when when we talked about our successes at Chalkbeat, we always led with impact. And again, we would generally track in two categories, and then there were subcategories, but informed debate and informed action. And, and so that's what we emphasized. Um, we When we did measure audience, and we did, um, we looked at kind of the standard numbers most folks look at just in terms of reach, but again, not our highest goal. When we were looking at more audience metrics, we wanted to prioritize ones that really reflected relationship building because that's what we wanted to do ultimately. It wasn't about readership, it was about connecting with communities. Um, and so we looked more closely at um, repeats. So folks who came to us more than once in a month, right? Um, folks who were coming back to us again and again to see what we were up to. Uh, we also came up with our own metric and we called it engaged reader actions. That included people who attended events, um, who were part of some of our SMS text messaging um, services that reported out on um, school board meetings and a couple of our bureaus, and also uh, folks who responded to call outs. So questions you know, that we were posing to our communities, um, requests for input, hey, how are you feeling about this topic that would really help them guide our reporting. Um, so those were those were some of the metrics that we looked at in addition to the, the impact numbers. Um, but curious, I, I know Sonam in our in our prep call you mentioned um, looking at canopy at, at how people who are directly affected by something feel about the story you produce. I'm curious about that. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think for us, you know. Um, it's that like equipping residents to kind of shape their neighborhoods. So for our, for part of that, you know, is, is that narrative change um, is what we hear a lot about. We're working with neighborhoods that feel like they've only been, you know, seen from a deficit mindset in many ways. Um, or like, you know, when one person described it as like, well, news only comes when there's a shooting. There's buckets when the cameras only come. And so um, for us, I think we're really thinking about how do we understand whether the stories that were chosen and shaped by residents actually went, led to that narrative change. And so again, that's where that community surveying is really playing a part and trying to look at, okay, how, you know, maybe, you know, six months, a year after we do this kind of like set of stories about this neighborhood, what, what is the, the difference that was made? And so that involves not only surveying once the story comes out, but also over time and as we're kind of continuing the presence in a particular area. That's such an important point to someone on the, the tracking over time, right? And not, again, going back to the idea of readership metrics that are very immediate, right? And you get this jolt of, oh my gosh, you know, 10,000 people looked at my story. That's nice. Um, but, you know, six months later, what happened? And I, I know at Chalkbeat, too, we've seen impacts happen 12 months after we did something. And that's really gratifying. Um, you know, so as, as you said, if you're continuing continuously in those communities working with people and it sounds like Canopy is right. And you're constantly listening um, and really kind of taking the temperature and seeing, OK, well, 
what actually changed and and did we have um, an influence in that in that change? Jean, how about it at Resolve? Any of this uh, resonate with you? It does. And I just want to give another plug for like using Airtable to track this stuff because there is a feature called chain of events where you can actually link um, impact that you have put into the tracker. So it's allowed us to tell a really wonderful story about our impact. I mean, you know, there is, there is, you know, impact that you can share with funders in your audience when it is, you know, fits within a neat box. But, but what you guys are talking about is chains of events over time that because we did this and then this happened and then this person followed up and then we had this conversation and that is something that, that that tool allows you to do, which is pretty cool. Um, and yeah, I, I think that, um, you know, for us, it's really thinking about is, you know, is the information that we are providing useful in people's lives, right? Whether it's the information we send out over a text line or the collaborative reporting that we're facilitating through Broken Philly, whatever it is, thinking a lot less about reporting about communities and reporting for them and thinking about their information needs. Um, and obviously, to be able to do that accurately and not just guessing, you have to develop those community relationships like Sonam is talking about, because um, it is we, you know, we as journalists are trained to to think that we, you know, can identify good stories and we can. And also a lot of those are based on assumptions that we have about what people want to hear or audiences in our head who are frankly often male or white or, you know, higher educated, whatever it is, this sort of imagined reader where we feel like we have to, you know, report about um, excluded or misrepresented communities for, you know, these other folks to understand rather than thinking about what information needs are over here. Um, so we think a lot about that. Um, you know, certainly a lot of our work centers around that narrative change component too, of how do we do more you know, asset framing rather than um, deficit framing or real attention to, you know, the language and word choice that we use. Um, that stuff is obviously, you know, so much more difficult to track over time and really takes that, that, that time investment of doing that surveying. And, um, and often, you know, for us, it's, it, there's less response when it's surveying and more when we're just kind of out and about and having conversations. And so that also, I think, feeds into the capacity conversation that we were having earlier. It's like not just someone who owns the tool, but are you enabling the staff and your NORS organization the time to develop these relationships, the time to go back to people and talk to them about the impact of your reporting? Um, because all of that, all of that is part of, of doing work that centers impact. Yeah, I think uh, there was very vigorous nodding from Sonam and me uh, during during your comments there, Jean. I don't know if you could see us, but I feel like we were both like, yes, yes, yes. Um, the you know the the imagined audience, the audience in in your mind's eye um, that we default to instead of asking questions and being present and just showing up, right? As as reporters, as journalists, as members of the community, um, and deeply listening to to what's happening. Um, so I think that's so important to to really hammer home as, as organizations focused on impact, that that has to also kind of be at the center of, of your work. Um, okay, we are gonna move to questions, but last, last point I just wanna say is, I hope this is helpful and maybe you'll take away some tips but also like invent your own metrics. Um, like make 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 this work for your own organization. Every organization is slightly different. So Chalkbeats Impact Tracker is a little bit different than Resolves, is a little bit different than Canopy Atlantis, right? Um, no two orgs are the same. And so don't feel like you need to follow the pack in terms of what you're prioritizing, in terms of measurement, in terms of the kinds of impact that, that you're looking at at your org. And I just think that's really important that to, to feel freedom to, to invent new metrics if, if you want to. Um, okay, we are gonna move over to questions. Um, and we're gonna start, I think Jean's gonna take this one, um, about using impact wins in fundraising appeals and, and how, that, how that works. 
Yeah, it's um, it's really helpful. To, to you, period, right? Um, and I and you know, again, there are, there are ways to make this easier if you have robust impact tracking within our impact tracker. When people um, go in to put in impact, there's like a checkbox about whether this would be useful in like grant reporting or external communications. Um, and so people check it if they feel like it, you know, is useful in those circumstances. And then when Cassie and I are going back and doing grant reporting or sending out, we send out a quarterly update to all of our funders, just like, hey, here are things that are going on. We always have a place to highlight impact and it makes the writing of those, you know, appeals or updates so much smoother and so much easier. Um, but as I said before, it is it is so much about the the stories that you're able to weave with your impact. Um, you know, some speak for themselves, like the ones that that Benna referenced in the beginning of just like there was this story, there was policy change, but the other ones that are that are deeper, that are more complex, that are about behavior change, that are about you know equipping or resources folks in your community, they are harder to write into fundraising appeals. But I would I would I would challenge you to do so. And maybe it's you know maybe it's in an appeal, maybe it's more on the one on one conversations that you're doing with um, donors or program officers, but practicing weaving those in because I think the more the more funders hear that that is impact that we are aspiring to in the profession, the more they will be willing to support that kind of work. And as we said, like this is resource intensive work in the in because time is our most valuable resource. <laughs> and so it takes time. And so the more we can use these stories about that deep impact, to go after general operating support rather than project-based funding, um, to go after multi-year grants, whatever it is, the more we are going to be able to, to do this work long-term and to sustain it. 100% plus one to everything you just said. So I'm gave you snaps. Um, you know, that, that kind of tees up our, our next question from the audience here. Uh, how do you avoid overprivileging types of impact that are more visible, sorry, visible or measurable and underprivileging impact that's harder to see or track? And I just want to echo Jean there in terms of the kinds of impact that you might use with funders in, in getting money and doing your grant reports, because it's really important that we're not overprivileging the, the sort of, again, like two year long investigative pieces, but that we are really privileging the daily interaction and the daily kind of acts of showing up in communities that is arguably more important in, in the long run. But Sonam, I think this question is is perfect for you with, with all of your community listening and, and your surveys. Yeah, and you know, I think this is a really tough one, right? Because the incentive against us in many ways um, as an industry. Um, but I think this kind of, for, for me at least, and, and this is just because I love I'm like a logic person, you know, not everyone has to be this way, but like, I love, um, you know, I, I, I think um, being really clear uh, again about that, like change model that you're hoping your work does, or not even hoping that you know your work does, I'm sure everyone's work is, is making an impact. But I think the more you can clarify that, um, if you publish this story, if you start this program, like, what are you hoping happens? Like, what is that big picture thing? And like, that's what you have to be measuring, I think. It's like, that's what you have to be delivering on, not the reach, not the, and, and, and I think those are things that, um, I think I think there are a lot of different ways to do that, right? It doesn't, it's, there's no like one size fits all way, but I think that was something that really helped clarify for us. Like, you know, it doesn't matter that the story gets read by the most number of people. It matters that it gets read by, people who are directly affected by it or who live in this neighborhood and that they felt like, you know, equipped to do something else, to have some type of action, you know, I think is the language that Chalky uses or to, to, you know, our conversation or, or some other next step, some intervention to help shape their communities. Um, and so I, that helped us really narrow down what to prioritize there and, and helped us understand that what we really need to be focused on are those really, you know, um, I hate using, even using the word small, but those kinds of um, community, resident, individual level interactions, but also understanding how to track them at scale. And that's something that we're still thinking about is like, all right, you know, we're not the largest organization. So how can we balance like the fact that we are getting all this information back from folks, 
jobs, but also don't, you know, we don't have someone right now who's, you know, I think assigned to do this all the time. So I, I think that's still a negotiating process, but one that I think we take really seriously. Um, I will add on to that and also adjust something I saw come up in the comments. Um, I mean, in terms of how do you, you know, avoid overprivileging, I think it's just, even if, for example, if you, you know, have a grant report where they are asking certain questions about your impact, even if they are not asking about the impact that you want to tell them about, tell them about it anyway. <laughs> I guarantee there's a place on the forum where you can just wax poetic about the things that you want them to hear. And they know that like none of us want to write longer grant reports than we already have to, but it might be worth putting in, you know, a couple of those additional comments or, you know, at the end of a conversation with a potential funder saying, you know, I know we didn't really have a chance to talk about this, but just like bring in, bring in what you want to know, because they're not going to know it unless you start talking about it. And they're not going to know if it's important to you unless you start putting it out there. Um, and then I saw in the comments, we are not able to do like a live demo of the impact tracker that we have, but definitely reach out to me. My email is gene at Resolve Philly um, because folks on my team are available to do workshops for impact tracking and and other resources within the field. Um, the other place you could go to is modifier, resolvephilly.modifier.org. Um, and that is our sort of new home. It's a splash page right now, but after next week, it's our new home for, um, for professional development and work like that. Also happy to, to chat with anyone if, if you want to offline. Um, I'm benachapola at gmail.com and I can give you a little more little more context on, on how the Chalky Tracker was set up too. Any more questions? Last call for questions. This has been awesome and really interesting to me because I really nerd out on this kind of stuff. And I learned so much from my peers and colleagues like Jean and Sonam. And I'm really grateful to both of you for sharing your best practices and your learnings and I hope that it spreads throughout the rest of the journalism ecosystem. Thank you. So the next event in our local news field guide series is about building a diverse audience. That'll be on October 12th at 2 p.m. Eastern time. Please join us for that. And that will feature Caroline Bauman of Chalkbeat. Emma Carew Grovem of Kimbap Media, and Terry Paris Jr. of the New York Times. So thank you all for joining today. Thank you to Jean and Sonam for your generosity and, and um, sharing. And thank you all to everyone who joined today um, for talking about this with us. We appreciate it. <laughs>